You're officer of the day. No guard mounted. What are you doing? You're not playing blind man's buff dancing pumps. Imagine being a senior officer who's never done any formal training or been involved in any combat. In fact, your only qualification is a fat wallet. To our modern sensibilities and our belief in meritocracy, it sounds a bit mental. But was it? Today we're looking at the British Army's purchase system. What was it? How did it work? And did it lead to an army led by rich nitwits? Let's find out. It may seem strange to think of it today, but up until the 1870s, people brought and sold ranks in the British Army. The purchase system, as we call it, meant that officers' commissions could be brought and they could be sold. Every rank, up until Lieutenant Colonel, could be paid for. There was no need for exams, qualifications, or even an understanding of rudimentary military affairs. Only money. And this system of purchase was an official one, with the prices of commissions even set out in the King's slash Queen's regulations. The practice reached its height during the 17th and 18th centuries. I recently had historian Steve Brown on the show, and he has some interesting insight into the system. It wasn't unique to the British Army. There were some other European armies that also had a series of commission. I mean, the French had a similar system in the days of the monarchy in the Bourbon era, and the Austria-Hungarian army did something similar. So it certainly wasn't unique to the British army, but it started in 1683 by King Charles II. By the early 19th century, Britain was one of the few European nations still operating the system. So why was it introduced? And there are a number of reasons why it was considered to be a desirable thing to have, uh, in so far as the fact that commission holders who have paid money for their rank have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo and not joining revolutions and plots, because if they did, they would uh, lose their money effectively. So it was a sort of collateral against abuse of authority. It also ensured that candidates who were able to purchase their rank uh, were people of means. They had a private means, because this was an era where to become an officer... Uh, or, or to, to operate as an officer, you really needed a private income. Uh, even in the meanest of line infantry regiments, a young officer needed about £100 a year over and above their salary to pay for all the things that had to be fa paid for, you know, cost of the transportation, the cost of the, their, 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 their costumes, or the uniforms, uh, the cost of the mess bills, all those sorts of things. And in the guard regiments, it was something more like £500 a year over and above your salary. OK, but how did the system work? Now, bear with me, because this is really complicated. In fact, I don't claim to be an expert on how it worked, which is why I asked my good friend, Dr Chris Bryce, to help research and co-write this episode. A special thanks to him. OK, briefly then, let's try and explain. When a vacancy occurred within a regiment by an officer retiring or deciding to leave the army, every officer in that regiment had a chance to purchase the next rank. So, for example, if the lieutenant colonel retired, the majors in the regiment, in order of seniority, were given the chance to buy his rank. In turn, this would create a vacancy for a captain to purchase his majority, a lieutenant to purchase his captaincy, and so on. So it's important to realise that this was all about money. In other words, a rich captain could potentially purchase over the heads of the majors if they couldn't afford that lieutenant colonelcy. Now, there were limits on purchase and regulations were introduced over time to try and limit some of the worst abuses of the system. Technically, any rank had to be offered to the officers of that particular regiment in order of seniority. In theory, only then could officers from outside the regiment get an opportunity. However, it wasn't unknown for officers to be offered money to turn down their opportunity so that some wealthy individual from outside the regiment could come in and purchase. I told you this is a difficult subject. But bear with me, we are going to get to the bottom of it. There were, of course, ludicrous examples of small children and women obtaining commissions in this way, and technically that wasn't legal. The noted historian and novelist Sir Walter Scott remarked once that We know ourselves one fair dame who drew the pay of a captain in the beep, unnamed dragoons, and was probably not much less fit for service than some who at that period actually did duty. <laughs> Rather scathing comment. It was Prince Frederick, Duke of York, an average field commander, but an excellent military administrator who, as the commander in chief of the army from 1795 to 1809, ended this abuse and improved the system. Thanks to him, no commission could be given to anyone under the age of 16. 
two years service was required before a captaincy could be purchased and six years before a majority and any new candidates required recommendation from a serving field officer. Whilst these were big improvements, they were easily got around by people with enough money and enough will. A bit like today's legal system. By the way guys, I just want to interrupt really quickly to ask what do you think to this t-shirt? If you're half the man I think you are, then I know you're going to love it. Well, I've just designed a few different t-shirts and sweaters etc that really reflect our shared interest in British military history. I'll be adding more designs over the next few weeks, so check out the links below or scan the QR codes that are currently on the screen. Every sale means an extra two quid or so for me to keep the channel and the podcast running. Okay guys, sorry for the interruption, let's get back to the film. The purchase of a commission was considered an investment. As E.S. Turner wrote, all too often the commission was not sought as a means of entry into an honourable profession, but as a gambling counter which could be exchanged for a more valuable one. Therefore, it was essentially a useful asset that could be brought and sold, a bit like today owning a house. In fact, also like owning a house, for many, it was also their pension plan. Money paid to purchase a step of rank didn't just disappear somewhere into the army, never to be seen again and disappearing into consolidated holdings or something. It was, in fact, a retirement fund. When an officer retired and uh, left the service and assuming that they had purchased their ranks and they wanted to get their money back, it was said that an officer uh, had sold out. What that really means is he got all his money back from all his purchases and that was his retirement fund. And that could be anything like four to five thousand pounds if he's gone the whole way to lieutenant colonel and even more if he was in the guards regiments. And that was a considerable sum of money in an era when a lieutenant colonel earned about three hundred pounds a year. Um, to walk away with four and a half thousand pounds at the end of their career, even if they're only in their 40s, uh, that's like more than 10 years of salary. But it's also worth pointing out that contrary to popular belief, not all commissions were paid for and not all promotions either. For example, a dead man's shoes, an officer being killed or died in action, his rank was not filled by purchase. It was offered to the next most senior officer down the, down the list. Any senior officer who was removed to the general officers list, which occurred quite a lot in 1814, because the regiments were mostly quite top heavy, if a, if a, a general officer within a regiment was removed to the general officers list, that his rank was filled by an officer without purchase. If a regiment was augmented, in other words, additional companies added to it or additional battalions added to it, all the new um, ranks so created, could not be purchased. And an officer appointed to a staff position, uh, for example, a major appointed lieutenant colonel on the staff, uh, did not have to purchase. So there's plenty of applications where purchase was not necessarily applicable. If an officer died on active service, the next senior junior officer was promoted to that rank without purchase. Indeed, until 1856, if an officer died on active service, the money he had invested in purchasing his rank was lost to his family. So therefore, it was against his interest to want to see active service. This must have led to some severe conflicts of interest for some men. But it was also why there was a famous toast in many officers' messes to a bloody war. It was a chance for men of less means to jump up the ranks. It's also worth adding here that the system did only apply to cavalry and infantry. Artillery and engineering officers did not have purchase and promotion was by seniority, i.e. length of service. The reason being that it was felt the so-called scientific branches needed a level of study and commitment and a degree of specialist knowledge. <laughs> Hilarious really that infantry and cavalry commanders weren't thought to need such training. I'm sure a few of you are former sappers and gunners and you may have a strong opinion about that. The cost and competition for commissions also depended upon the reputation of the regiment. The fashionable cavalry regiments fetched a premium. Take for example some of the British Army cavalry leaders during the Crimean War of 1854-56. Lord Lucan, commander of the cavalry division in the Crimea, is said to have paid £25,000 for command of the 17th Lancers. That's about £2.8 million in today's modern money. In doing so, he purchased over the head of the senior major of the regiment. I am Lord Cardigan, that is one. The Earl of Cardigan, who was a bit of a nutter, paid exorbitant amounts for command of regiments. He's said to have paid between 35 to 40,000 pounds for command of the 15th Hussars, and then an astonishing 40,000 pounds for the 11 Flight Dragoons. That's about 4.6 million pounds in today's money. Imagine now a colonel today having that sort of money to hand. I don't know, maybe some do, but probably not many. But in the less fashionable regiments, there were many who hadn't purchased. 
It was estimated from the 1830s through to abolition in the early 1870s, one third of all commissions in the Line Infantry Regiment were not purchased. In the Cavalry and Guards though it was only one six. So whilst it wasn't impossible to get on in the army without purchase, it was more difficult. But some famous names did manage it. So if it was so expensive and led to many bad officers reaching senior rank, why did the system last so long? Well, contrary to the way we might see it today, the system was surprisingly popular, not just within the army, but to the wider society as a whole. As the notable historian of the British Army, Sir John Fortescue wrote, the system being utterly illogical, iniquitous and indefensible, commended itself heartily to the British public. Oh my God, so there's it, fall back, fall back! <laughs> For every obvious example of insanity or ineptitude being promoted by the purchase system, there are also counter-arguments. James Wolfe, arguably one of the finest commanders the British Army has ever known, was first commissioned at the age of 14 and saw his first action at the age of 16. Although he didn't purchase every rank, this system of allowing basically children to become officers enabled Wolfe to be a lieutenant colonel by the age of 23. Eventually he became a lieutenant general and was only 30 when he achieved that rank. And this wasn't an isolated example. Men like Generals Charles Napier and John Floyd and Field Marshal Sir William Gom would all be considered child soldiers today. Also, a good example of where the purchase system really worked was the career of the Duke of Wellington, a man well covered and well loved on this channel. Between 1787 and 1793, the future Duke purchased commissions in and out of various regiments to advance himself. To the point whereby he became a lieutenant colonel at the age of 24 without having seen any action. Here's Steve again. The fact that purchase existed for nearly 200 years, I said to a lot of people that it did, it did in fact work. And it was in fact way more effective than the system of seniority used in the Ordnance Corps, the Royal Artillery and the Royal Engineers, who as a rule appointed senior officers to go on campaign who were always too old and at least 10 to 15 year, years older than their inf infantry and cavalry counterparts. There was no purchase system within the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy had way more officers available for employment than they, than they could actually employ and a lot of uh, naval officers sat for years on half pay or never got employed in action at all. Also the, the armies of the East India Company uh, didn't use purchase and again they had a very old officer corps, usually much much older than the regular army, um, because it really relied on people staggering their way up <laughs> like a civil service list, uh, waiting for all the people above them to retire. So you know, the purchase system allowed for a sort of internal mobility, and the fact that it worked for so long uh, has proven that um, it, it, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It might, it might stun modern sensibilities, but it, uh, it worked at the time. So having said all that then, why was the system eventually and finally abolished? Although the British Army took a long time to divorce itself completely from the idea of the gifted amateur, the gentleman of breeding rather than brains, the late 19th century started to make this necessary change inevitable. The days of an officer simply having to be a gentleman were coming to an end. By the middle of the 19th century, the debate over the topic had increased, but neither side had an overwhelming majority. For those who wanted to defend the system, they could point to their victory over Napoleon. This was proof that the system worked. They also pointed to the money it raised for the Exchequer and the money it saved as officers' pay had been kept low because of the independent incomes of the majority of the officer corps. Defenders of the system also pointed out that it would be very expensive to get rid of it because they would have to repay all of those men who had paid for their commissions already. Summed up, the argument was, don't mess with the status quo. But to others, the practice was not only antiquated, but also iniquitous. It held back the development of a professional spirit within the officer corps. It ensured that the widening of the officer corps to include the middle classes was all but impossible, and thus ensured that the officers of the army came from a fairly restrictive portion of society. Criticism focused not only on the fairness of the system and its suitability for the army, but also on the large-scale abuses of the system that still took place. Commissions regularly changed hands well above the going rate, which in itself was an offence. But how could it be prevented? In 1868, with the election of a Liberal government, Edward Cardwell entered the War Office as Secretary of State. He embarked upon a series of military reforms generally known as the Cardwell Reforms. 
The aims of these reforms were not so much the improvement of the army as a fighting force, but improving its efficiency. The motivation for this was the hope that a more efficient army and military system would in the long run save money. The call for abolition by the Liberal government wasn't so much about the system itself and how it operated, although there was an element of that. It was more about the impact it had on the army and the principles at stake. Finally, after much debate in Parliament, Cardwell decided that he had to abolish the purchase system and be prepared to pay considerable compensation. Estimated at £8 million, that's £786 million in 2023 money. It's important to understand though that even at this point when it was being abolished, it was less about being fair and a meritocracy and more about just improving the bureaucracy and making the running of the army easier. As Professor Edward M. Spears has pointed out, if Cardwell had been attempting to change the social composition of the officer class, he would have had to accompany abolition with considerable raises in the rates of pay and a more professionalised officer training programme. Neither of these were planned. Finally, after a battle in both Houses of Parliament and some legal shenanigans, the purchase, sale and exchange of commissions was cancelled from the 1st of November 1871, bringing to an end the system of purchase. But change was slow, and it wasn't really until the First World War that the demographic makeup of the officer corps slowly began to change. The abolition of the purchase system should be seen as an important milestone on the road to greater professionalism and efficiency within the British Army. If you found that interesting, please like, subscribe and comment. Let's share this video. Let's get the youngsters involved in learning about British military history. I'll be back with a new video next Friday, 6 p.m. South African time. That should be 4 p.m. UK time. All right, guys, I'll see you then.